Hey there, Nick Jatakis here. In this video, we're going to go over why I really like using Docker Compose in production and have been since about 2015, which at this point in time is 10 years or more. So just a heads up, you know, this is not going to be an end-to-end -end how to tutorial on setting everything up. You can always check out my example starter apps for Flask, Rails, Django, Node, and Phoenix. They're all using Docker Compose and are set up to work with development and production. And honestly, you know, funny enough, 95% of the moving parts on deploying your app with Docker Compose it's kind of unrelated to Docker Compose. You know, it's really about setting up a Linux server and picking how you want to actually trigger your deployments. Maybe do you want to get pushed to your server and things like that. Actually, later on in this post here, we will go over some examples of this, just not end-to-end -end super tutorial mode. The goal of this post really is kind of just to plant a seed about using and trusting Docker Compose, as well as going over all sorts of different things about why I like Compose and why it's my default pick to deploy an app to production. You know, with that said, there's always a time and place for Kubernetes. I've used it quite a bit for different projects over the years. I actually really like it when and it makes sense to use it for those types of specific projects. It just happens to be not my default. So this post is not going to be, you know, just ragging on Kubernetes and saying, oh, Docker Compose is the best, always use that. But yeah, let's start a little bit with some success stories. It's kind of funny on this channel, you know, I don't really have an intro video on my channel and my videos are kind of all over the place, right? Solo developer just does stuff. You'll see things about NeoVim and Flask and Docker and shell scripts and like just all over kind of, right? Just development focused things. But Primarily, I do contract work for different companies, building apps, deploying apps, doing infrastructure related work, platform, SRE, uh, DevOps engineer, like whatever you want to classify these things as. So I picked out a couple of examples of projects where we were using Docker Compose to deploy something. And, you know, I tried to get, I guess, a healthy mix of different things here. Obviously, not all of them over the last 10 years, but just a handful. In one case, I was uh, helping some folks deploy a Rails app that did a whole bunch of different data analysis. Again, trying to keep things a little bit vague here, not using specific business names. But at its peak load, it was like, you know, deploying to 40 AWS instances here. And really, it just came down to doing a ton of background work almost continuously here. And it was a multi-million dollar business. Basically, they were just scraping a whole, bunch of a whole bunch of data, putting it in their database, and then giving folks a UI. And, you know, those folks were paying them uh, money to get that information here. But yeah, that was just like, you know, Postgres database, uh, Nginx using Rails with Redis, et cetera, Sidekick for background work processing, all just handled with Docker Compose there. Another one was a fintech company running a whole bunch of different uh, Python and PHP services on individual servers, you know, VPS, basically just a Linux server there. Typical LAMP stack here, also using Memcached and Redis as well. That company did really well for 12 years and eventually got acquired by a $500 million company. So yeah, Docker Compose up, did pretty good there for them, I would say. And then, uh, yeah, another one was uh, a Flask app just to collect info from different data sources, unify it and sell it as a service. Um, nothing to do with this app at all, completely different, but also I see the way I worded it pretty similar, I guess, but in this case, different tech stack completely. But yeah, this was just a solo developer who had a passion for a really niche field, built up a side business, and now that pays for his New York City rent here. And again, just using Flask, you know, database, cache, Nginx, blah, 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 blah. Pretty standard stack stuff here. Another one with a Flask app here, we're just helping folks find really good items to drop ship. So this one had, um, yeah, a pretty interesting outcome. But yeah, again, same stack as before here, Postgres, Nginx, Flask, Flask Redis, et cetera. But uh, this was just a solo developer who started six months later, they were making 90,000 USD a month with like a 95% profit margin and their cloud hosting bills for the server database, et cetera, was about a hundred bucks a month. So I would say the outcome of that one was, uh, Pretty good, I would say. <laughs> yeah, the Flask ones actually make me real happy because they were both developers who took my build a SaaS app with Flask course. They had a good idea, they executed it, and they were rewarded for their efforts. All my course really does is go over, you know, how to build an app with Flask. Uh, they did the rest there, so hats off to them. Obviously, not literally, um, but all these apps and more had uh, quite a few things in common, right? Just get pushed to a Linux server, run a couple line shell script after that push was initiated, wait a couple of seconds the app is deployed. Yeah, some of them ran their database in Docker as part of the Docker Compose project. You know, others used a managed database. Some of them chose to split up their web and worker onto separate servers. Others just kept it in one. Really, takeaway there is, you know, using Docker Compose doesn't always mean you're locked to literally one server. And again, with this idea of web and worker, you know, if you're using something like Rails, you might be using Sidekick as a background worker. If you're using something like Flask, you might be using Celery. You know, other web frameworks and technologies have different uh, tools for these things. But yeah, it's just executing stuff asynchronously outside the web request response cycle of your main web server. Anyways, yeah, let's move on to the next section here, which is going to be a little bit about some questions and answers. So over the years, folks have either emailed me, dropped comments on my blog somewhere, or maybe they took my Flask or Docker course, and they basically just have questions about using Docker Compose and how it relates to using it in production. So I'll do my best to, you know, I aggregated some of these questions here, and yeah, we'll go over some of the answers here. But basically, it's like, you know, why would you use Docker Compose here? Isn't it meant just for development? Uh, how does it scale? How do you 
handle deployments and then also like what's the overall experience been like so let's let's tackle these in order here so yeah isn't docker compose meant for just development uh i don't know i don't think so at all but yeah at some point very early on in docker's life i can't give the exact time frame i just do remember seeing the wording in the documentation where you know maybe there was a one sentence call out somewhere that was like yeah docker compose you know isn't quite ready for production yet but that is long gone. And honestly, for me, it's always been about the results. Like if the thing works, it works, right? Like with that said, you know, I'm not a maniac. I'm not super reckless, especially if I'm deploying things for other people. You know, I did put Docker Compose to the ringer the best I could for all the apps I was building and deploying. And it worked. You know, I felt confident enough to put myself on the line and start using it for clients fairly early on too. Uh, the second application I ever deployed was for someone else who paid me money to help them Dockerize their app, run it in production with Docker Compose. So yeah, my definition of works is, you know, can I spin up multiple containers in a way they stay up? Has it consistently worked? Is it not crashing in un unpredictable ways here? Is it stable on multiple systems? Does it have all the features I need? And sometime in 2015, all of these checkboxes were checked for me. And uh, the very first app that I deployed was an early stage portal to let folks buy the V1 version of my Flask course. And it handled distributing the course in a one gigabyte zip file after confirmation of payment. Because back then I just zipped up all the videos and the source code in one single zip file, and then you would just download it. That's way, way different than the current platform where you can stream videos, et cetera. But back then, you know, it was a real app that took $199 payment from people, and then it gave them a digital product. And, uh, you know, I didn't mention this app earlier in the success, success stories there. I just wanted to call that one out there because yeah, I'm a firm believer of using and trying things out for my own stuff before I risk using them for clients. And of course, you know, exceptions can be made if a client is literally like, hey, by the way, um, we really want you to work on this thing. And I'm like, I don't, you know, I haven't really used that yet. And they're cool with it. Then yeah, happy to always learn on the job. I actually like those experiences. It's really fun. With that said, yeah, Docker Compose works fine in production, pre-prod, maybe a CI pipeline, continuous integration, or any other environments you want to spin up. I'd actually say this is a really huge advantage of Docker Compose because in general, there's parity between all these environments. You know, you run your Compose up in development, you run your Compose up in CI, you run your compose up in production. I'll actually make a separate post about that because this concept of like dev prod parity is pretty big and uh, there's all sorts of things to go over there. And uh, yeah, next up, does it scale? And this one actually comes up a lot question wise. And I think for a large tier of applications, it sort of kind of doesn't matter. And you can always vertically scale as needed, which goes a long ways, basically just adding more resources to your server, maybe doubling the memory or giving it more CPU cores, whatever you need, basically. And uh, yeah, the default case though, for me is spinning up your Compose project on one server. You know, maybe use a managed database. Maybe you don't, that's up to you. You know, most web apps typically are IO bound, you know, typically just waiting for some results back from your database there. CPU is typically not something that's bottlenecked. Again, it really depends on the use case of your app. Of course, if you're you know, transcoding video or something, yeah, that's going to use a lot of CPU. But yeah, if you have another typical application where it's just kind of, you know, rendering out forms and tables and, you know, looking things up from a database, getting results back, not a whole lot of hard calculations there, you know, typically you are going to be IO bound and uh, maybe your app is using quite a bit of memory. Again, it also depends on whatever web stack you're using there. Uh, but yeah, if you can serve your P95, basically 95 percentile latency traffic under, let's call it 100 or 150 milliseconds on a single 20 bucks a month server, like that could be good enough, right? And if that's not good enough, then like what is good in that case? You know, like maybe these numbers are crazy and maybe you need to have your backend respond in one millisecond or two milliseconds. And yeah, you can still do that, you know, depending on whatever tech stack that you're doing. But yeah, these are like reasonable numbers just to aim for, for your general purpose web application there. But yeah, whether you're, you know, your traffic is whatever 200 requests per day or maybe 20,000 per day, you can always dial that vertical scaling knob up if you need more, right? That just means adding more memory or CPU to your single server, you know, going for maybe two CPU cores to four or, you know, eight gigs of memory to 16, whatever it happens to be. And, you know, there's all sorts of different cloud hosting providers out there. DigitalOcean is one of them. And, you know, they have servers that have 32 virtual CPU cores and 256 gigs of memory available. You know, most of the apps I deploy for either myself or clients, et cetera, to run like real actual production traffic, you know, it could be two to four CPU cores, maybe four to eight gigs of memory. Sometimes it could be even a little bit less depending on the tech stack and whatever it happens to be. Um, also, if DigitalOcean is too expensive for you, you know, there's like Hetzner and other places out there who, yeah, in this case, you know, I looked at the prices right before making this video here and like you can get 48 virtual CPU cores and 192 gigs of memory on an NVMe SSD for 320 bucks US a month there. And again, you know, that's I'm recording this in mid 2025. Uh, that is a massive amount of compute resources there. You know, imagine a scenario where let's say you have, I don't know, 10,000 paying customers, you know, depending on your tech stack and the app's traffic characteristics, you might be able to host that on a server with, I don't know, maybe two CPU cores and
and four gigs of memory. So, you know, compare that to something like this and like this is a lot of uh, compute resources there. Even if you had to double this one to be something like four cores with eight gigs of memory, that's still totally reasonable, right? It's always going to depend on whatever you're building. But yeah, if you have 10,000 paying customers paying you 20 bucks a month, if it's 10 bucks a month, that's 100K times two, that's $200,000 a month. If your server costs you $40 a month, like kind of works out pretty well in your favor, I would say. Uh, but what about some unpredictable large traffic spikes, right? The above is great if you have reasonably predictable traffic and you don't want to provision your server and increase costs, right? If your app normally gets, let's say, a thousand requests a day, but you also need to handle spikes up to a million a day, you know, that can come at randomish times. And yeah, maybe you could look into using something more cost effective than running a higher priced machine to handle your max workload 24-7. Uh, but here's the interesting thing, though. You know, something like Kubernetes here is not a silver bullet, right? If you run Kubernetes on a cloud provider, let's say, you're using something like EKS with AWS, you know, you still need to have nodes that need to spin up and join your cluster before your app is capable of handling that load. And that's not specific to something like AWS, that's just like how Kubernetes works, right? You have some compute resource, it's in your cluster, and then you can use it for whatever you need to do. And really, it doesn't matter if you're using managed nodes, you know, in this case with EKS, it's, it's spinning up uh, EC2 instances for you whenever you provision your cluster's worker nodes, et cetera. You know, you can do uh, auto scaling groups to allow those worker nodes to go up and down. You know, maybe you want to have four nodes and then go down to two, maybe you want to jump up to eight, depending on your workload, whatever. You know, you can do all sorts of different things like this. You can also use something like Carpenter or even Fargate. And I don't want to go into the details of all of that, but like the end result here is compute resources need to be available in your cluster. Then your app needs to be rolled out on those compute resources. And this takes time, right? The out-of-the-box experience for all of this, it could be many, many, many minutes before your app is actually being able to serve traffic here. And you know, you can always do better here and you can achieve uh, maybe a cost balance with, you know, less time here to provision stuff uh, with some custom implementations of things. But uh, yeah, that's going to take some pretty decent sized engineering effort to pull off. You know, you can't just uh, expect to pick Kubernetes, like roll your face on the keyboard, do two hours of vibe coding, and you're going to have a perfect solution that's going to work for you. Um, I would actually suggest maybe reading some of Shopify's blog posts, like their engineering blog posts specifically around, you know, how they were using Kubernetes and other things to handle all sorts of crazy different traffic. You know, you can imagine like whatever, some celebrity is trying to release something, uh, they call it like a flash sale. And now there's suddenly there's like 800,000 people hitting your site in one minute. So they need to be able to handle those loads. Uh, you know, I'll try to link to that in the description if I can find the blog post. I remember one from like eight years ago that was really, really cool. But yeah, maybe they have even more recent stuff. I haven't checked them out. But I just know like, you know, this is not an easy problem to get new compute resources into a way that it can actually be used very quickly without like over provisioning stuff. So yeah, uh, something to think about. But yeah, going back to Docker Compose, like how do you actually handle the deployments there? In my opinion, one of the easiest ways is just to use Git, and then you can actually use the post receive hook. So with Git, there's this idea of a bare repo that you can push to. I don't want to get into all the gory details here, but yeah, you set up a, a bare Git repo here, and now you can do something like Git push prod main, where prod, you know, it's some arbitrary name that you want. It just maps back down to your server's uh, hostname or IP address here, where that uh, bare repo is located. And then, yeah, you just push to your server. This can be done from your dev box or maybe in your CI pipeline. It's really up to you. The good news there, it works the same in both cases. So this is kind of a great case where, you know, maybe you're a solo developer. You just want to run that from your dev box. Totally fine. Maybe you put it up on GitHub Actions. You also now deploy from there instead, which is cool. And then maybe you expand your team. Maybe you have some workers uh, on your team working there as well. And now suddenly they can also deploy from CI without needing direct permissions to your server. So it's up to you on how you want to handle that, but it all works the same in the end here. And yeah, there's server receive that push and then that kicks off a script of your choosing to do whatever you need to do. You know, maybe pull, uh, you know, Docker Compose pull, Docker Compose up, maybe run a database migration. You can even send something like a Slack notification, uh, whether, you know, it worked or not, depending on what you want to do. Literally, this script could be anything. It could be a shell script, it could be a Python script, it could be a Ruby script. It could have any code that you want in there. It just gets initiated when that Git push happens there. Uh, the real beauty, though, of this process here is it's 95% the same across projects. And that's uh, a really big benefit. And like, it really is. You know, since we're dealing with Docker Compose commands, it doesn't really matter if you're deploying a Flask, Rails, you know, Django, Node, or whatever app. It also really doesn't matter the details about the app itself. Maybe it's just a web server, or maybe it's like a web plus worker, cache, database, WebSocket, full text search, all of that. You know, these are all implementation details of your Docker Compose file. You know, the deploy process is basically the same. And for the parts that might be a little bit different, you know, maybe uh, one framework doesn't have database migrations or something, you can just add hooks into your deploy process, like a pre or deploy hook, to have different things happen depending on, you know, 
whatever is going on with your deployment. Again, it's totally up to you to do these things. So yeah, my typical like go-to deploy stack would just be, you know, using something like Terraform to create your actual cloud resources. In this case, you know, something like your servers or DNS records, or if you're using something like AWS, maybe you can create your S3 bucket using Terraform, right? Infrastructure as code. And then also uh, Ansible to actually get the server itself set up here. You know, I prefer using Debian or Ubuntu here, LTS, you know, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, Ansible is going to do a great job of just getting the server available once the server is actually there. Technically, you can use Ansible to provision the server itself, but I find Terraform to be a better fit for that. And then also when it comes to your applications, yeah, like Ansible would install Docker, you know, setting up users, firewall rules, log rotation, all that good stuff to make your server production ready. But then Docker is just going to be running these apps. So yeah, through Docker Compose. And then finally, you know, you just use Git to actually initiate the deploys. So it's like set up your cloud resources, get your servers ready, you know, get your applications running, and then you can deploy it with this using four different tools all working together to give you a really great solution there. So yeah, how's the experience been? It's been really good. So not only has everything worked out of the box for the dozens of apps I've deployed over the years, but the complexity has remained fairly low. So, you know, if I want to deploy, let's say a completely fresh new app to a server, have it secured over HTTPS in a fully automated way. Um, all I really have to do is configure a couple of things with Ansible, wait five minutes or so for everything to spin up, and then I can just push my code and there you go. And like literally, uh, this is all the code necessary to make all of that work. Now, with that said, of course, there's a lot of Ansible things like roles and playbooks, et cetera, facilitating all of this stuff. But like, you know, this is, I guess you can say an API that I kind of extracted out of real world use cases for the last 10 years or so, where it's like, yeah, where's the Git repo uh, hosted locally, you know, in a directory somewhere? What kind of commands do you want to do after the deployment? You know, this is handling things like setting up uh, Let's Encrypt on this specific subdomain, but you can have wildcards too. It does DNS-based validation, blah, 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 blah. And then, yeah, Nginx, I actually like running outside of Docker. I've done a blog post about that. I'll leave a link to that one in the description here. But yeah, you're just letting Nginx know, like, what's the server name going to be? You know, where are the assets? And then, you know, doing a proxy pass back to your container, which is then uh, published on just localhost here on whatever port your app happens to be running on. You know, this way it's not accessible from the outside world. Only uh, things running on the same server such as Nginx will be able to access it. And then, yeah, we can cache assets as well. You know, just a little convenience for some Nginx things. But yeah, the really cool thing here though is like, let's say that you wanted to deploy a Flask app instead of a Rails app in this case, it's really no different. You know, maybe this becomes Docker Flask example or whatever app that you're building. And then the migration command is going to be different, right? We're not going to do a Rails DB migrate. Instead, we're going to do a Flask DB migrate and that's it. And if you're doing something else with Node or whatever, then uh, you can just run those commands instead. If you don't have any migration command, then just remove that line and you're good to go. If you want to do something before the application gets deployed, then you can do a pre-deploy command. And you know, that's a documentation of this role that I wrote here. But yeah, all that stuff is super similar across different tech stacks here. And, and yeah, the general purpose Ansible playbooks and roles do all all of that, but they're not magic. You know, I'm not showing them here, not because I don't want to, it's just, it's too much for this type of video here, but they just set up an automated process to keep your server up to date, secure and healthy, you know, make sure all sorts of different things are installed and configured. Uh, this could literally be done with anything that's not specific to Ansible. I'm sure one day I'll release them if I ever finish my deploy to production course. You know, this has been uh, a waiting list for this one for quite some time here. And uh, yeah, it's super interesting here because uh, yeah, if you want to see this course, let me know because otherwise I don't know just because it's like ever since AI has gained a lot of traction, the organic traffic to my site has been going down in such a way that like, I don't know if making courses will be sustainable moving forward. That's kind of why for the last couple of years, I focused a lot more just doing contract work and open source stuff because yeah, the course stuff kind of died out. I still have so many ideas and so many different things I'd love to do, but like these things take a really long time to do them. And like, you have to be able to pay rent and eat and things like that, right? But yeah, anyways, that's not the focus of this video. Focus of this video is uh, consider using Docker Compose everywhere because it's great. And uh, yeah, that's it. So if you like using Docker Compose and you've used it in production, it would be really cool to share some of your stories in the comments. And also if you have any questions about any of this, happy to share uh, whatever I can. So yeah, I'll reply to all comments there. If you like the video, please give a thumbs up because it really does help a lot. Uh, with that said, thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next video.